Teddy, darling. <laughs> Hello. Is that an introduction? Are you ready to introduce our guest? <laughs> okay. It's hello and welcome to Pet Talk with me, Anna, and Teddy. You need to sit up, please. <laughs> and Teddy, that's it. And do you want to say hello to our guest? Hello. <laughs> Can we say hello to our guest? <laughs> there it is. Hello. <laughs> and hello, because we've got today with us Sue Williamson. And I am so excited to speak to you, Sue, because oh, she is a a groomer with a difference and it's a very big difference yes. um, so, welcome please tell Thank us you. about uh, um, taking the girl out of grooming okay so uh, as well as being a groomer i'm a behaviorist a canine behaviorist so when i groom a dog i don't groom in a traditional way uh, how I was trained when, when we're trained we're trained to you know you bath the dog then you put it on the table and you dry the back legs and the front legs and the body um, and do everything in a specific order and doing everything in a specific way and I've thrown the rule book out the window I follow the dog's body language and I adapt the groom so I don't I don't groom two dogs the same I don't use any restraints or safety aids. I groom on a low table so the dog can get on and off the table whenever it feels uh, it needs to. So if it's getting a little bit stressed, it will get off the table, have a wander around my salon, then get back on the table so that I can continue. So it's all very, very calm and very chilled. The dog has, um, the, the dog's able to, um, Give, give me permission to groom. So when it's on the table, grooming takes place. When it's on the floor, I stop grooming. Uh, some, for some dogs, even getting on the table is too much for them. So then I groom them on the floor. I sit on the floor and groom them on the floor. So it's all very, uh, it's all very dog centered uh, to go with the dog. And I don't, I don't, the priority for me is not the aesthetic look. It's the emotional feeling of the dog throughout the groom so the dog gets groomed it, you know it's probably not the best groom in the world it's never going to win crufts or a grooming competition but they get a, a good pet cut and they're happy when they leave the salon as well which is all my guardians are bothered about so it's quite different to the traditional way of grooming so Everything that you described there is, is like, it's Teddy's worst nightmare. And yes. we've been on a journey, Teddy and I, to find a way to help him deal with grooming. But I can tell you that I dread that appointment on my diary. And oh. I dread it because he has hated it for so long for you know so much so i've i've taken lots of steps to make this easier for him for one i stay with him because he has very separate anxiety so i stay with him i have learned to distract him when needed but the thing that really so when it when we started and i saw the tables up high yeah and those restraints, I understand why they're used, but I also know how much he hated it yeah. because he felt trapped. He had no choice. It was something that was being done to him. He hated it. And then, of course, there's the, the blow dryer. That, oh, my goodness. <laughs> yeah. That sounds like his very worst enemy, the vacuum cleaner. Yes, but that's that, that's extremely an extremely common reaction to the dryer. It's exactly, and and a I nemesis. And being with him, I would be standing next to him, and I could feel that's like a flipping gale force wind hitting him, hitting yeah. me. I could understand why he doesn't like it. This is a dog that doesn't even really like it when the car win uh, the the windows in the car are completely down and the wind is hitting him in the face, he gets uncomfortable. If things are flapping around, he's uncomfortable. He's not keen on wind. And here's this thing 
that feels like this. So the very first thing that I did was work with my groomer to remove the restraints. Excellent. That's, That's massive, makes a massive difference. And we were getting to a point where he could actually come in, but he, he was shaking. You know, oh. I didn't have to carry him in, but he'd be shaking. I put him on the, on, you know, he, he'd just be clinging to me. And of course, came the day where he went in and he wet himself. Oh. And I, I can't do this anymore. So I, I had a brainwave and I said to her, please, could I wash him at home and blow dry him with my hairdryer? Because he's much better with that. Yeah. So it's, it's gone on. And each time I think that he's better, then we hit another hurdle because I realized actually he's, he's just got better at tolerating, but he's not yeah. happy. Yeah, and I think and, that's the problem with, and, with a lot of dogs. They just learn to tolerate it. And exactly. then one day, one day something happens and they can't hold it in anymore. And they have a meltdown. They try and bite the groomer or they just wet themselves on the table like you described, or they completely shut down. And it, it's, it's really difficult to see that when you know what you're looking at and yeah. why why those things are happening it's it's actually quite distressing to see a dog get to that point so distressing because we were so we've been kind of bumping along with this routine for a while um and then he started to get less tolerant of me brushing and blow drying him yeah and he became less tolerant of that then he became less tolerant of the actual groom. And, and I started to think, okay, so um, what do I do now? I'm doing everything I can do now to, to make this easier. And I decided, okay, so I'm going to take two hours to blow dry him instead of one and make it so that he has lots of breaks. You know, he's, when he's had enough, I got him a licky mat. So yeah. I'm always make sure the grooms are in the morning after breakfast and that he has his breakfast on the licky mat while I'm blow drying with breaks. Yes. <laughs> and that was really good because we had got to a point where he, on two occasions, he was, he had to be muzzled. Oh. And, and you, you know, when, you know, when you get to that point where you've got to muzzle them, that there's something. Exactly. It's exactly. It's, and it's the point of no return of muzzle is for me. Exactly. And the and on the second occasion when he was muzzled, muzzled the very last occasion he was muzzled, um, she couldn't actually cut the hair on his face because the muzzle was on. So so <laughs> there I thought I I don't know what to do next. And then I thought yes I do know what to do next. So I changed a lot of things. And one of the things I did was I brought him his absolute prize. And the, the, the prize is, um, I, I don't know if I dare say it out loud. We usually use abbreviations for this. All right, um, okay. Um, which is his favorite. And I, I ask him to sit still and allow her to do it. And then he gets, he gets um, one of those for each thing that he allows us to do. Yeah. Uh, and I trained him to do that by between that last horrendous groom and the next one, every night I got his permission to brush his face in exchange for this wonderful prize. And <laughs> he, was, he was okay with me brushing his face. I would only do it for a little while and then I did it for longer and longer. And now we've got That's a good, good his face. And that turned it around in six weeks. But if, it, if, if guardians put the effort in, it's amazing what can be achieved. It's and it's what I loved, you know, when I, when I was because I was writing this story for um, a group on Facebook, and somebody mentioned you and about grooming by consent, and I thought you have to come on because that's exactly what I do with Teddy all the time, you know, in every other context, he has I have his consent, you know, when yeah. I'm brushing teeth at night, I say to him, "Are you ready?" And he presents himself, you know, just Aww. in the room. 
And then when I say, when I'm done on that side, I say, okay, are you ready to do the other side? And he takes a moment and then he turns and he does the other side. This is how we do everything. So for grooming, it, it felt, I'm sure it felt to him like a, a full on assault. So it's, yeah. um, so I think it would be good to hear from you about what people can do to help their dogs. Okay then. So it's, it's, it, it sounds a bit mad. And uh, I, the first technique I used was something called the bucket game by Shrag Patel. And I've just got a little tub and you teach the dog to look at the tub. Uh, and every time it looks at the tub, you give them a treat. So what you do, once they're constantly looking at the tree, you're just building that duration up. And whilst they're looking at the tree, then you start just touching them. If they look away from the, the bucket, the, the tub, you stop touching. If they look back at the tub, you can start touching again. And once they've got the hang, that actually, I've got control of this. If I look at the bucket, she'll touch me. If I stop looking, she'll stop touching. Then you can start doing it with a brush. Then you can start doing it with scissors. Then you can start doing it with clippers. So all the time the dog's looking at the bucket, it's giving you permission to do whatever you need to do. So that was my first consent groom. I love that because that's like a, that's a, what you're doing is you're creating a signal for yes and no. Yes, yeah. And and since then I've, I've adapted because although the bucket game is really good, it does take commitment of the, the guardian to teach it at home as well. I've not got time in the salon unless they bring the dog every day for four or five weeks to do that work. So it, a lot depends on the guardian, whether I teach that, that way or another. But I have found the quickest um, consent method to use is what I call a table protocol. So dog on the table, it gets touched, it gets brushed, it gets Clip, you know, it gets clipped, it gets scissored. But if dog gets off the table, grooming stops. And um, I, I ne I'm never failed to be amazed that the dog chooses to get back on the table. But they do often, it's just they get off the table, go and look out the window to see if the guardian's coming back, and then back on the table and sit there quite happily and let me carry on probably five, 10 minutes, then get off again, have a look, have a wander around, get back on the table. And it just makes it, it's, for me, it's just so relaxing for me because I'm not battling with a dog that doesn't want to be on the table. I'm not having to avoid bites because they don't have to bite. If they feel the need to bite, they get off the table. It's, it's just easy for them. But then, I mean, obviously I never do anything to, to get them to the point of having to bite. But I know everybody's not got a grooming table. So there is other techniques you can use as well. There is one can called- I Sorry, I, I just want to jump in there because when you were talking about them um, being on the table and off the table, yeah. that's but that's so dog, isn't it? Because what they don't like is intense contact. Um, yeah. you know, they avoid, and you, if you watch them when another dog approaches, if it's getting a little bit too intense, they look away. Yeah. They do, things. they you know they move away. They do all sorts of um, things to calm down the interaction. Yeah, yeah. And it's <laughs> on the, if we put them on the table and we restrain them, they don't have the option to no. say, this is getting a bit intense now. I'll, you know, I'll take a break. I'll move away. Sniffing, you know, they, they need to sniff to, yeah. to calm down. None of that is present. And when no, you... As well, the, the restraints as well, then limit their movement. Because some dogs, for example, if a dog's got something like hip dysplasia that might be a bit uncomfortable in the hips, they sometimes they need to move on a regular basis to just release a bit of tension in the hips. Um, fearful dogs anyway like to move regularly. Um, old dogs like to sit down. You know, and in fact, nearly all my dogs sit down anyway. So I don't know why I'm saying old dogs because nearly all my grooming dogs sit down while I'm grooming them. But that's not the norm in the salon. The norm is the dog stands throughout yeah. the groom. And that's that's an awful long time for a dog to stand still that doesn't like that process. And then not only are they having to stand still, they're being made to stand still. 
so it, it just escalates then of course then if they do get anxious and they haven't got that that opportunity to get away they have to use you know the fight flight fall around techniques and then that winds the groomer up because they're not standing still then it's just a vicious circle then of the dog's behavior escalating because of their emotions and then the groomer struggling with this dog on the table that won't stand still and they can't groom it so it's um I, i'm a big advocate of not using restraints it just makes life so much easier so you you are going to talk about next what happens if we haven't got a, a grooming table yes. to if you haven't got a grooming table it's, it, again it's not the end of the world what you can do you can choose a um a specific towel a specific mat uh, a bit of carpet that you've got hanging lying around and you make that the table you put that on the floor and you train your dog that when it's on that piece of cloth towel carpet that's contact takes place again you start with the touch then you start with um then you move on to the brush and then perhaps the comb and whatever else you need to do for the grooming um, you can give it treats all the time as well if you need to uh, and then that mat becomes the equivalent of the table so on the mat it gets groomed off the mat grooming stops come back on the mat grooming restarts it's a really easy um technique to use I I used it first for a um one of my friends working cocker spaniels she'd uh, I'd been grooming her other dog for quite a while uh, but she never brought her working cocker to me because she thought it'd be too difficult for me because where she was taking him it took two groomers and a muzzle and the normal restraints to groom him uh, so she didn't want to put that risk on me and she'll tell me about it how he is and I says just bring him we'll try it if it doesn't work then you know you can take him back where where your groom's now and this dog it was just absolutely amazing I sat up I knew that the table would be a big trigger for him because that is associated with where he'd been previously being groomed so I just got I've got a memory foam mattress uh, a dog memory foam mattress in the my cabin and I just sat on that waited until he came and sat next to me started stroking him uh let him get up have a walk around then he'd come back and sit down so stroke him again and in the end I was able to do a full groom on him just using this mat and it took me what 20 minutes to train him that on the mat means you get touched off the mat you don't and all he would do he would sit next to me I'd do two or three strokes of the clippers he'd get off walk round round me round the back and come back sit back down a few more strokes of the clippers round the back come back sit down at me and he just needed to move so he had a major change from going to rumors where he was on a high table and and i particularly found gun dogs really don't like high tables um i don't think any dogs over keen but particularly gun dogs in my opinion find high tables really aversive um he got no restraints on him he hadn't got groomers holding him still and he just got choices so he allowed me to do what I needed to do because I was allowing him to do what he needed to do as well so um so that's the, the map protocol again it's very easy uh the dog I had in this morning he's got a real aversion to having his feet touched but what we've done now for him is he puts his paws on the table We've got to lick, give him a licky mat, puts his front paws on the table, and that's his permission for me to scissor his feet. And he'll just stand there until he's finished the licky mat. And then, yeah, I've had enough now, get back down. And again, it saves me from getting bitten because he will bite. He's, he's, um, he's turned and snapped, hair snaps. He's given me a warning a couple of times. But now I've found what works for him. He doesn't need to do that anymore because... If, if I'm getting too close or I'm putting a bit too much pressure on, it just gets off the, t removes his paws off the table and he knows I'll stop. So he doesn't, it's like being at the dentist really. I've, I've got a big fear of any dental treatment, but our, my dentist always says, if you want me to stop, just put your hand up. So by having that choice, being able to put my hand up, I find I don't need to use it because I know I can stop the treatment at any time. 
And these canine permission techniques or consent techniques are giving that dog exactly the same um, option of opting out when they need to. Um, you know, it, it's interesting you talk about, you know, the dentist, because I, I, I really feel that this is the equivalent for most dogs. Oh, I definitely. <laughs> because I can take Teddy to the vet. He's not thrilled, but he's okay. But because going to the groomer is a regular event and people think that, you know, in time they get used to it, they get better. Actually, my experience is in time, he gets worse because each encounter heightens the level of... of the thing is with that is each time they go into the salon, they get to that salon door and their anxiety levels are raised straight away. And each time their anxiety levels are going to be that little bit higher. So you get to the point where their anxiety levels are near threshold before the groomers even touch them. Exactly. And that was one of the reasons why I've started by working um, with him at home so that he was happy at home. Because the last thing we needed was for him to already arrive there, stress. Yeah. Because, you know, he's, he's going to be anxious the moment he, he knows he's there. So there is so much in, in what you've just said that is, is so, so telling. Because it's, it's the whole notion of de-escalating the tension. Yeah. Bringing that tension down. Taking up, it, it's actually, I'd say it's one step further than that for a lot of it's taking that tension away in the first place. We don't have to bring the tension down because it's not there to start off with. I must admit, because most of the dogs I groom now are referred to me, so the association of being in the salon does make some dogs more anxious. But once they've been coming to me three or four times, they know then that I'm not going to put them on the table, I'm not going to put restraints on. So that that level of anxiety when they come in the set the salon lowers each time they come and I usually find by appointment five or six they actually come in the salon the body's quite nice and soft you know they've got a nice soft body nice soft eyes they're coming up to me for fuss the sniffing around the salon because I find sniffing around the salon is a big sign of uh the, the confidence in the salon, because I, I find personally, if a dog won't sniff around the salon, there's a reason why they won't sniff, and that's usually because they're too too anxious to be able to do that. And that's then, um, have it, I find often they'll be a bit, ooh, I'm not sure, for a few minutes, and then they'll have a drink of water. I think you've just dropped. I'm still here. <laughs> can you hear me? Yes, I can. I, I yeah, it's all right. I thought we'd dry. <laughs> yeah, I, you I, froze. I, yeah, so things like can the dog interact with me? Can they interact with the salon? Can they drink water? They're all really good signs that the dogs are relaxed enough to do that. That's another really good point because the first thing a dog wants to do when it arrives anywhere is sniff. But how yeah. many dogs yes. do to sniff when they? when they arrive at the at the groomers it's it's straight away we're down to business exactly and and so they ha they haven't yeah, even had they a don't get the opportunity no so so there's yeah, all these, so there's all these things that add to their their sense of i guess entrapment feeling trapped and and coerced yeah well, there's a lot of uh, what we call multisensory processing that needs to go on when they arrive at the salon, particularly the first couple of times. They need to process uh, how the floor feels, how the room smells, what, what the salon looks like, um, different sounds, different textures, different pieces of equipment, uh, different smells, and they need to process all this information. And a lot of dogs don't get that opportunity to do that before the whipped up, plopped in the bath and being bathed or onto the table and start being brushed. And they've not had time then to process. So now something else is happening and they're still not processed the environment. And 
they're first they're being brushed and then they might be put in the bath and they never catch up with that processing. So they never get relaxed in that environment because they've not been able to process the information properly. So what I, in, in my salon, I never groom a dog the first time it comes to me. Some dogs I don't even touch the first time they come to me. Uh, I use a technique called ACE free work. Have you heard of that? Oh, yes. Uh, yeah, because so. Sarah Fisher. Sarah Fisher's ACE free work, yes. And I'm, I was actually the, the first. <laughs> Yeah, I was actually the first groomer in the world to use Ace Free Work in the grooming salon. So they come in, they get lots of different services, lots of different treats on these services, and they just involve themselves in free work. And while they're in, doing free work, they're relaxing themselves. So they're able to take all this information in, they're able to process because the karma, and it just gives them a first positive experience in the grooming salon. It's dead easy. I don't have to do anything. I just put the stuff out and then I just sit back and watch, uh, talk to the guardian, get get more information from the guardian as well. Because I find um, when I was in my training and the guardians would bring the dogs in, they'd have the dog on the lead and they couldn't communicate properly with the, the groomer because they were thinking about what the dog was doing and they got the lead in their hand. And if the dog had started barking or shaking, they would fussing around the dog. So they didn't always hear what the, the groomer was saying to them. But now, because I do the free work, I've got a deck chair in my salon that the clients sit on and they just watch the dog. And because they can see their dogs relaxed, because they haven't got a lead in the hand and because they're not having to mess about with the dog, they're much more open in what they tell me as well. So I gain a lot of information from them why the dog's doing free work. And it also means that why I'm gaining information uh, from the guardian, that the dog is free to just do what it wants. It doesn't have to worry about me touching it. It doesn't have to worry about the garden keep touching it. And it just makes for a, a much more easier introduction to the salon. So I, I sorry, I carry on. I was just thinking about what you were saying there because there's so much in that and um, already you know what you're talking about is creating a positive environment so that the dog comes in and and feels safe because it seems that what you're doing all the time is building trust and yeah. it, it's here you are a perfect stranger why should I allow you to touch me let alone you know wash me and all the other things that go on with it, it so you're you're giving them that respect that allows trust to be built and yeah. you know what a wonderful thing to do you know they come in and it's like you know a room full of toys in a sense because <laughs> so I have toys cool. in as well <laughs> nice and you know I'm just thinking about how sensitive they are they're so sensitive that we know they can actually sniff, sniff out cancer and cortisol and other things so if they go into a normal salon where other dogs have been there and have felt anxious, already they're going to have that sense of this being a, a place that's not very pleasant. Yeah, they're going to get a stressful environment straight whereas, away. Whereas they come into you and other dogs have been happy here. And so yeah. they have that sense of danger and tension when they come in. I love this. I really love this. It's wonderful. Yeah. And I I let a, a lot of guardians stay as well because some of the guardians travel 50, 60 miles to me. So I can't expect them to go and sit in the car outside. Uh, but then again, guardians that live around the corner with a dog with separation anxiety, they can stay as well. If their dog's more relaxed having them present, then to me it makes sense to let them stay because I want their dog to be relaxed. And I've got a guy, he, he comes about 30 miles. And he says, I love coming here because it's my, it's my couple of hours of complete calmness. He says, it's a, my cabin, he says, it's just like a haven of calmness. And I think for a man to say that, he's in his probably 60s, late 60s. So he's not a wishy what you know, he's, he's, he's a real man. And he says, it's just so relaxing in here. You know, the, the real feeling of calm. So I think that's, that's a real testament to the, the salon is calm, you know. And, and to be quite honest, I don't, I don't want a salon where it's all noisy and stressful. Like, I don't want to get stressed. 
you know, I don't have to worry about a dog lunging at me because it's upset. So if I can do things to make the dog feel comfortable, I'm comfortable as well. It's it's not rocket science. It isn't, um, but I think it rests on the words you use, dog-centered, um, because so much of what we do with our dogs and to our dogs is about us and not them. It is a welfare issue because dogs need to be groomed. Yes. And so from that point of view, it's not us doing it for the fun of it. It needs to happen. But we always seem to want to do everything on our terms. And yeah. um, you know, it's about getting the dog done in a certain amount of time. Um, you know, being quick and efficient and at the same time coming out with a dog that looks ready to go into a magazine or to crafts. And that I feel is not the approach that I would want to take with. No. with. And so I've, I've worked very hard to try to make things as comfortable for him as possible. And it's still been a, an arduous journey to get to where we are. So it's, um, it's just absolutely beautiful to, to see that you're doing something that is about the dog. Yeah. And it, 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 it's just, I mean, there is a growing number of groomers now that are grooming like I do. They've seen the benefits and want to groom the same because it's better for, for themselves, it's better for the dogs. It's given the dogs more control over the groom. So there are a growing number of groomers that will let the guardian stay, that will let the dog roam around on the floor and be groomed, that will do all the different protocols. Um, unfortunately, not enough yet, but we're growing. And I think in probably 10, 15, 20 years time, there'll be, it'll be 50-50, you know, there'll be half the ones that focus on the aesthetics which is absolutely fine for dogs that can cope with those grooms that don't mind being groomed. I've got one dog on my book that I can do whatever I want with, but I've groomed her since she was about 12 weeks old. So I, I put her in some amazing cuts for me. They're not industry standard because I don't get to practice often enough, but the owner is always, she's absolutely delighted how lovely she looks. But she's one of these dogs you could probably put in a paper bag and she'd still look great anyway. Um, but for me, it's it's about the dog's welfare, not about the dog looking beautiful. Uh, I'm not saying I, I send dogs out the salon looking awful because I don't, but it's just not the top of my priority list to make them look all oh, nice and, and fluffy and cute. And Yeah, I mean, you know, Teddy always looks amazing. He looks amazing when his hair is long. He looks amazing when his hair is short because he's Teddy and yes. he's a who and could he look anything other than amazing? I know, um, it's it's because you love him for who he is, not what he looks like. And, and also I think, you know, uh, the fortunate thing about our groomer is that she, she does a good job, you know, and a good job is a haircut that looks even. Yeah. And that's it, it's, he doesn't need anything fancy. He just needs, <laughs> haircut that looks even I'm not asking for anything else you know um for his nails to be clipped and you know his tail to be a little bit tidy because sometimes it looks a little bit like it's been going through bushes which of course it has many times um and so that's it that's all I need I don't want him to look like a teddy bear or this or that or the other because for him and for me that's unnecessary yeah. and so it's if a groomer can do that in a a way that is respectful of his needs I am delighted you know and I'm very lucky in a sense that my groomer within the parameters of what she knows gives him and that's it it's not that the groomers are setting out to upset the dogs it's how we're trained Yes. Dog behavior is not covered in grooming, or if it is, it's just a little half an hour session. So to have, um, 
I think one thing that would make the most difference in the grooming industry is to include dog training, uh, dog behaviour in the training. That would eliminate so many bites, so many stressed dogs, because the groomers would know what to look for. See a dog getting stressed, or, you know, at the early stages when they're just doing the calming, quiet calming signals, and just be able to, oh, yes, that doesn't like, you know, doesn't like having its, its feet brushed. I'll find another way to do that, you know, I'll make it easier for them. And if we had that in the groomers' training, it would just make so much more sense because then we could have more dogs that are um, able to cope with grooming because that from day one, the groomer has listened to them. There's so many implications to this because we're talking about it in the context of grooming. But yeah. if you build that trust, it means that there are other things that we can do more easily. And the first and most obvious one that comes to mind is the horrible issue of tick removal <laughs> you know <laughs> you know exactly why I'm saying that is because if they get a tick in an awkward place that they don't, that they don't like you touching it is a nightmare and I know yeah. because I've been there uh three times this summer three times we've had that. um and you know the the beautiful duck neck came out and really helped um in two of the three instances on the third instance, there was nothing that I could do because it was right here on the oh. corner. And with the best will in the world, there was no way Teddy was going to let me do that. And I did not want to do it. We had to find another way of dealing with this awful tick. Yeah. But it was just, it's all of that kind of thing. And I learned, I've learned that the that the Teddy is happy. And I've heard this from many of, his friends about many of his friends he's he, he does not doesn't mind being showered he's in the bathtub he is quite happy being showered by me which and that's the time for me to check for ticks yeah. to check for all sorts of other other things like mats etc yeah and because they actually show up so much better as well than dogs wear it <laughs> and and I know that we and this is something that we do Every day he goes into the bathtub, even if it's just for a paw wash. Yep. And that makes my life a lot easier because he's got that trust in me that, and also I think it's when he's patient. Yeah. He's patient. If I do things in what he decides are the allowed times, if I'm allowed to groom him, I'm allowed to brush him at the allocated time. Yeah. At any other time, He's busy. He's doing other things. What, what am I, you know, what, <laughs> what are you doing? <laughs> I'm busy now. I'm doing this jigsaw. <laughs> exactly. so, um, so we've got these times that I've inadvertently created this root schedule. It's yeah. a routine, but for him, it's a schedule. And I'm allowed to do certain things that are not his favorite on the schedule. And then that's fine. And, and then he can deal with it because he, you know what it is. He knows what's coming. Yeah. He's prepared for it. It's he recognizes it and it's fine. The only exception to this is if he's outdoors and he gets something stuck in his tail or his ears or whatever, and he needs help. And he then it's, he looks at me and goes, um, I need the cavalry now. And <laughs> off go. And very often we're working together because he's pulling one side and I'm pulling the other and we work together and we get get things out so you know what I do though now I carry I, I always have a treat pouch on me anyway yeah. I carry yeah. I, I've got a little pair of scissors in my pouch oh. so that when he goes in the, one of my spaniels goes in the bushes and comes out with a great big twig in his tail he he doesn't want to stand still long enough for me to untangle it so like, I'm just hey. I just put through it and pull it out yeah. and then he's not getting stressed because he can't do what he wants to do I'm not getting stressed because I know what he's going to look like when he gets them so I just cut through the middle of the twig a few times and pull it out and off he goes on his, his way great idea I like that very yeah. much <laughs> it's, it's I learned that quite quickly with him because he will go into it's a spaniel he goes into the hedgerows you know and brings everything out with him Exactly. Teddy's the same. Um, half the wood floor is attached to him at some point in the... Yeah, most of it's in my car. <laughs> exactly. 
I and, that, and I think this is what I've discovered is that by working with him and you're reinforcing that and we're understanding when it's okay to do what I can do whatever it is I need to do yeah. rather than just trying to push him and coerce him into doing things that he doesn't want to do um it's you know that tick that was there um after treatment that he allowed me to use on that particular night the next day I acted as though nothing was happening yeah. you know and took him out a bit earlier than usual I have to admit because I couldn't get wait to get him into the bathtub <laughs> got him into the bathtub and you know what I just pulled it out with my fingers and it came out whole yeah and what could have been an absolutely horrendous experience worked really really yeah. well and it's it can do my my working cocker he's he, he hates having his claws clipped i did all the training when i was a puppy and he was fine and then he broke his dew claw and since then his claws have been real problematic um so all I do now is he loves coming in the cabin when I go in to clean it's after a dog's been in or if I'm just going in to tidy some bits up or just go and get some he comes in with me and I'll say on the table for a claw and he gets on the table lets me clip one claw jumps off and goes back outside and that's it and then the next day we'll do the same thing again so he doesn't get stressed because he doesn't have time to get stressed he gets a treat afterwards so he gets praised for it and it's, it just makes it easy for me. I, I couldn't make, if I made him stand still to do all um, 18 claws, he, he would be getting really annoyed at me by the end. And in fact, I won't be able to do it because I won't be able to hold him still long enough to do it. But this way we can keep it all nice and easy, nice and light. I've got the facilities to do it every day. So I'll just do one a day or whenever he feels like letting me do one and we'll just keep his nails under control like that. I'm a lazy I'm really lazy <laughs> no I think you're really wise really I I think so I mean to sum up in a sense what we are saying is things that our dogs find stressful yep often they are stressed because they are a anxious about the procedure yes. and b because they feel pressured by us wanting to do things within a given time and so we're, we're not reading them we're not giving them the the space to deal with the stress and it just no. builds, builds and, and as well we have to think on top of that um we are supposed to be as guardians we're supposed to be the person that they trust and if we happen to force them uh with all the best will in the world if we're feeling that we've got to force them to have something our stress levels are raised we're more likely to shout at them we're more likely to rough handle them and they're supposed to trust us it it's completely the opposite way around you know we should build the trust first get them to let us do whatever we need to within what they can cope with and then we should be able to do more or less everything to them when we need to and, you know I, I i sit on the sofa at night i've got one of my poodles she all sits on my knee at night and if i'm sitting watching telly then i'll just lift one ear up and say here have a look in a room then put her ear back down or do the same with a tail or pick a paw up and say paw so you know to her she's relaxed on my knee i'm starting you know she she knows different parts of her body now but to do a bit of that daily as well uh, Andy Hale, if you've heard of him, he calls it stuff training. You're just doing stuff to your dog. You know, it's just just keeps them used to having their ears lifted, having the feet picked up, having the tail lifted, having the mouth played with, whatever. It's it's just doing it in a nice, relaxed way where there's uh, no attachment to outcome. So if I touch her, hit her ear and she moves her head away, then I let her ear go, you know, but mostly she'll just sit there and she'll let me lift her ear, have a look inside. Sometimes I give it a little tickle with my finger inside as well and then put it back down. <laughs> and, and, and every dog is different. And, you yes. know, he, the minute he senses that we're actually looking at something or in rather yeah. than... The intense, when the intense... It, 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 
you know, then you, it's, uh, I, I, I think he would call it handling with intent. He yes. <laughs> straight away. And that's not allowed because it's not the time to do it. So I know that bath time is the time to do that. Time to do it. So if I, so that's when I, I do that kind of thing. It's like I do the checking because that's when I'm allowed. And he comes out of, as he's coming out of the bath, he, what he does is he puts his, I put the towel on the edge of the bath. He puts his paws on the edge of the bath. And that's when I dry his paws. And when I'm drying, oh. paws, I'm allowed at that point to, to play with them. So, so I use that to check for mats and anything else that might be hiding in there. So you're I, already using paw protocol. Exactly. Because that's, yeah. that's, you no, know, he's, he's very, he's very clear on what's acceptable yes. and what's not acceptable. You know, it's, uh, Teddy has written the guidebook to handling Teddy for dummies. You know, he's really, <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's a pity they all don't come with one of those, isn't it? <laughs> So he's very clear on what's allowed and what isn't. And, and so there it is. And, and I, that's when I do all my playing with, you know, and checking this and checking yeah. that, lifting his beard, you know, uh, yeah. in check that there aren't any ticks in there. That's when that, all of that happens. Um, so it's, I think we all need to just be a little bit more sensitive and cognizant of what, yeah. what's to do you with. Slow down, slow down. You know, it's that isn't it it's the slowing down because yeah. we're always rushing and I really learned that uh, about you know blow drying him and preparing him um, for the groomer if I give myself an hour that's not long enough because he can't have breaks if I take give myself two hours we have a lovely time and he's a happy dog you know I don't dry one of my food well I, I've started to dry now because I've done the work now but when she first started to come, when she first came to me, she was a year old when I, I rehomed her. And the, the Hoover is a nemesis anyway, but the dryer, she couldn't cope with that dryer at all. It was the, the, the monster from hell the dryer was. So I just cut it, clipped her short. And what I did, it must have been about two years, was just bath her a good towel dry and let her air dry the rest of the time. And in the meantime, I've done a little bit of desensitization and counter conditioning. And I've found if I dry her at the same time as my other poodle, she she wants she's pushing my other poodle out of the way. Let me get it's my turn. It's my turn. Dry me, you know. <laughs> That's fantastic. Absolutely <laughs> wonderful. So maybe, you know, this is also a reminder that we, you know, we've been talking about let, letting, letting them trust us. Yeah. Actually, we need to trust them. Oh, God, they're amazing at letting us know. It's, it never fails to amaze me what, what dogs will tell us if we listen. And also to trust that they are going to want to work with us. You know, it's, yeah. we're, we're always so afraid, you know, that they're, they're not going to let us do things when actually, if we approach it in a very sensitive, gentle, respectful way, they will give us something back. Yeah. You know? and it my, can, that can be different for every dog, you exactly. know, and that's what it's all about. It's finding that, that different technique for that dog that makes, you know, it, it's, it, it, you know, brushing teeth is not something that dogs do in the wild no. uh, but I, I learned early on you know to just let him lick the toothpaste off my finger and then and then when we were happy with that to you know just put a little bit in his mouth and we built it up and now you know it's bedtime and I say to him okay you ready to brush your teeth he's in position and yeah if he's in an awkward position for me I say Teddy darling you know can you just move Please. a little bit? And he and he puts himself exactly where he needs to be for me to be at the right angle, and and that's that's amazing. I every night I marvel at this. Yeah, it, it never yeah. that feeling never goes away. So we have to also trust that if we have that open door, they will reward us. Oh, definitely. It's, and it doesn't it doesn't happen overnight. 
it takes a lot of time, a lot of patience. I've got a, um, a dog I've been grooming. I've been grooming about four or five years now. She's nearly 13, so she's had a lot of grooming and done some of the salons as well. And when she first came to me, there was no way she would let me touch her rear end. To groom her rear end, what we had to do, a guardian would come in and she'd hold her and she'd let me, she'd just about let me clip her back end if it was overhanging her guardian's arm. Now she comes into the salon, she puts herself on the table. For a start, she used to come in and she used to hide under the table and I used to have to play ignoring games to get her to come out. But now she comes in, she gets herself on the table. It's obvious she still doesn't like it, but she lets me do it. And now she'll let me do um, a back end as well. A lot of it is done from her in a sitting position and she'll splay her legs to one side so I can clip the inside of her legs. And then all I've got to quickly do at the end is put my hand and arm under her belly, just quickly do a bottom and down the back of her legs. And she'll let me do that now. And I never thought we'd get to that point where she'd let me do that, but she does, you know, and it's, it, that's what's so fulfilling about this job when you get there to be able to do those little things that they really struggle with when they trust you enough to do that. I know that Teddy, does the equivalent of rolling his eyes every day when I when I do the the quick check of his paws and he sighs like oh here we go again when I'm doing his face but he lets me do it and I do it as quickly as I can to and and that's okay and then it's over and and I know he's letting me do it because he's putting himself in position to do it so he's it's like he's saying to me right I don't know why this is important but I know it's important so yeah. I and I I know what you're going to do and it's okay but get it over with please <laughs> can we get, <laughs> it get on with it woman <laughs> get on with it that's okay and that's fine I, that's that's a, a good working uh, compromise yeah. now we know that unfortunately there isn't one of you on every street corner is there okay. an organization that people can go to to find groomers who are working in in the way that you are uh there's not an organization at the moment i'm afraid uh you can look for um some a lot, lot some of the groomers have done a course called fear free grooming so you can look for that fear, fear free grooming there's a low stress handling course it, that's one i've done uh so you can look for low stress handling groomers um Probably one of the best places, particularly in the United Kingdom, is to join my Facebook group, which is Taking the Girl Out of Grooming Dogs. Uh, we've got lots of consent-based groomers there, and you can put a post up asking, you know, is there a groomer in Birmingham that uses the, the ethos of this group? And if there is, they'll put the name down and you can contact them. So that's a good option as well. Um, Unfortunately, we do need to sort out a, a directory of consent-based groomers, but it's it's just another thing on the list. <laughs> I, I imagine your list is very, very long. And if they are um, wanting to contact you, um, firstly, whereabouts are you and how could they find you? Okay, I'm based in Leicestershire in the United Kingdom. I've got a Facebook page, which is Happy Paws with Sue which is my business name. I've got a website, which is www.happypawswithsue.co.uk. My email address is info at happypawswithsue.co.uk. I've also got an education portal, which is mainly for dog groomers, which uh, is www. I can send you all these links if you want. www.takingthegur.co.uk, and I've got lots of courses on there, like uh, dog behaviour for uh, yeah, dog behaviour for dog groomers, Tellington Tea Touch, uh, Animal Centred Education Free Work. So I've got quite a few different training I courses. I saw those, and my first thought was, I want to find the time to do them all. Um, so. It <laughs> They did, did. They just look amazing. And so if you are a dog groomer and you're watching this and you are inspired by our conversation, um, I am going to be putting a link to Sue's website and all of the information she's just given yeah. um, on the description box to this interview. And Sue, thank you for everything. Don't forget, it's all about the three books. 
I've got three, three books. books. I've written three books as well. Uh, they are all taking the girl link. So this firstly is taking the girl out of the grooming salon. That one is aimed at dog groomers. Uh, it talks again, it talks about dog behavior, things like trigger stacking, calming signals, the autonomic nervous system. Uh, it talks about what um, different areas of the salon and what triggers there might be there. Uh, talks about consent grooming, there's free work in there, and there's some talent and tea touch in there as well. Uh, which, if you don't know what talent and tea touch is, it's a, a way of calming dogs down using contact, physical contact with them. Extremely useful. So uh, that's taking the girl out of the grooming salon. Then I've got taking the girl out of grooming your dog, which is for probably people like you a couple of months ago that were struggling to to find a way to groom your dog. So there's the canine permission based techniques in there. Again, there's a bit of talent and tea touch and the dog behavior stuff as well. Uh, on top of that, it's you know how you can help you, how you can find a groomer, what to look for and what questions to ask. And then lastly is my latest book, which was released two weeks ago, which is Introducing Your Puppy to Girl as Grooming. And that's aimed at people that have just got a puppy and want to uh, help their dog cope with grooming right from day one. And that is all, you know, counter conditioning, desensitization and introducing things positively from day one. So instead of waiting until your puppy's six months old and then trying to worry because you can't brush your dog, it explains how you can brush your dog from day one using positive techniques. So they're all available on Amazon or if you're in the United Kingdom, you can buy direct from me. That's absolutely brilliant. I'm so glad you mentioned that because um, I certainly, I, I wanted to um, get hold of one of your books for sure. Oh. <laughs> and, um, and, and I'm sure others will, will have links to those also. Yeah. Oh, sorry, my poodle's barking at the next door neighbor. <laughs> So uh, thank you so much, Sue. You're very for welcome. All, all that you're doing and for getting the word out there that there is uh, a way in which we can help our dogs cope with what for so many of them is an extremely stressful part of their yeah. lives. Yeah, and for, so, you know, yourself, for cockapoos and the other poodle crosses, it's not something that happens just once, twice a year. It's a regular basis and to have that regular trauma it's yes. it's not good for the dog's health and it's not good for the dog's emotional welfare or physical welfare or mental welfare either so yeah. if I can make a difference to a couple of dogs here and there then that's so much the better well I have no doubt that you're making a difference to many many oh, dogs thank you and thank, thank you for giving me the opportunity to possibly help some more dogs as well it's absolutely uh, my pleasure Thank you all for watching. And I will, I guess, be back next week with Teddy. I don't know what we're doing because we never do quite know what we're doing from one week to the other, but I'm sure that it will be fun, entertaining, and perhaps inspiring, hopefully inspiring. Until then, goodbye. Bye.